Let's do that again. Let's have another countdown. Okay. Such a weird music for our session. It is um, March 19, 2023. So do you like our background music? Right. Um... Uh, previously, uh, we actually had uh, an episode uh, on beaver bath and uh, gathering wood. Uh, but uh, for this uh, live stream, we'll be having uh, the following topics. Vehicle registration renewal. So we'll be talking about uh, my experiences. Okay, there's also... Uh, the sad, you know, sad news, uh, the demise of uh, Bicol guitarist Jason Vicente. He, uh, he, ju- he died uh, early Saturday morning. Uh, it's Sunday night here in the Philippines, by the way. We'll also be talking about beach combing. So are you into beach combing? So we'll be talking about it. Also, uh, the Buntot Pagi. So there. I have here the my buntot pagi connected with the Philippine martial arts and blade culture, and also my uh, lecture at UPD Lima on Bicol blade culture. All right. Before uh, anything else, let's have uh, a channel ID. Kakaroon na naman ng pagtaas ng COVID-19 cases dito sa Pilipinas. Subalit ayon sa gobyerno, wala raw na ang pagsuyo ko ay multong haplos. Huli na akong tumampi ng libong taon. Papailing ning, paggamit ning, Kinabayo could very well be an articulation of this folk. Then we go farther forward and we'll go to the false sheet. At saka ito, syempre, ang ating sword. <laughs> Kasi naman, ano po, kung talaga may sword. back to our topics for this live stream we'll be talking about my experiences at LTO for the uh, LTO uh, vehicle registration renewal and also condolences to the family of uh, Bicol musician uh, Jay San Vicente we'll also be talking about uh, Beach combing. So are you into beach combing? And of course, the uh, buntot pagi as being part of Filipino martial arts. And also uh, amulet or talisman culture. And we have also I'm gonna be sharing something about my uh, lecture at uh, UP Diliman on Bicol blade uh, culture. So there. By the way, I got my guitar again, so really nice. Irish 
between the guitar. Anyway, uh, LTO. LTO uh, renewal of uh, vehicle registration. Let's put this here. Uh, by the way, thanks for joining me. Uh, this is a live stream, but this will be uh, uploaded later on uh, at my uh, Hagbayon channel here on YouTube. Uh, what about the uh, vehicle uh, registration renewal? Have you uh, renewed your uh, motor vehicles? I mean, have you renewed the uh, registration of your motor vehicles? I, I think here in the Philippines, you have noticed the prevalence of uh, what the prevalence of checkpoints, particularly LTO checkpoints. Unregistered vehicles, and while you're using the unregistered vehicles, there's a danger that will be fined uh, up to 12,000 pesos for that. So there, uh, mm, as you know, uh, the uh, scheduling for uh, vehicle, vehicle registration renewal would be, uh, you know, Dependent upon the what? Dependent upon the uh, plate number of your vehicle. So, uh, as you know, the plate number would usually have, uh, or would actually have uh, the alphanumeric element. When you say alphanumeric, you have their alphabet part letters, and then you also have uh, the numeric element or the numbers. So you base it on the uh, last digit of your plate number. When you say digit, the number element, the numeric element. So you actually have to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, up to zero. So it's like one to zero. There's no 10. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. One being January. So two being February, three being March, so on and so forth. So that's how you actually uh, figure out when, when to renew the registration of your vehicle. And uh, for example, if the last uh, digit of your uh, plate number is uh, three, then you are to renew your vehicle in March. However, uh, you have to look at the penultimate digit, you know, the penultimate digit. For example, your, uh, the penultimate or the, the digit before the last digit, because we have three digits, three digits there. So the second digit is uh, say uh, seven. So that would mean uh, um, you are to renew your vehicles uh, during the uh, third, yeah, third week of the March, the month of March, I mean, I say, kung your the last digit is uh, seven. That means you have to renew your vehicle registration in March. But the second to the last digit is like three. Then you have to renew it. I know, uh, se seven. You have to renew it uh, on the third week. But if the last digit is three, then you have to renew it on the what on the uh, month of March because as we said to figure out which month you just count one to zero one two three four five six seven eight nine zero one being January two being February three being March so on and so forth second to the last digit it's like if it's one to three then it's in, it's first week of the month. If it's uh, four to six, then it is uh, second week of the month. And if it is uh, seven, eight, then it's third week. And then if it is nine, zero, then it is in the fourth week for the scheduling. Right? So. That's how we do it. You know, let, me, let me repeat one to three, that's like first week, four to six, second week, seven to eight, uh, that's uh, third week, nine to zero, 
that's fourth week. And what will you bring? Of course, we'll bring your certificate of cover or the insurance cover coverage. So it, it is advised that, uh, for example, your registration month is March. Then prior to that regist registration month, you already try to secure a COC or your certificate of cover or the insurance uh, coverage. And you already tried to secure also the other requirement, which is the certificate of emission compliance as per the Clean Air Act. All vehicles must comply with what we call as uh, uh, smoke emission test. You know, a smoke emission test, uh, you know, qualification. So you have to comply with that and you have to actually. Make sure that your uh, vehicle is not what is not adding to our pollution problem. And this is a, a, as per uh, Cleaner Act. So there you have your COC and you have your uh, certificate of emission compliance. So shout out to all those who are running, you know. Emission centers. So kudos to you guys for doing your job well. <laughs> you are helping in, uh, you know, making the environment better for everyone. And of course, after that, you have to go to the LTO and you have to pay. I actually don't have the the receipts and all the other stuff that you know I had to pay. Um, but. Uh, you have to go there to go there for the vehicle inspection or the motor vehicle inspection report. So it will be duly uh, what duly accomplished, and uh, well, you better comply with all the <laughs> requirements. Uh, your vehicle ought to be roadworthy because you know what if your vehicle is not roadworthy, it will you know entail you know, fines again from the LTO or from the uh, local government unit, care of our police officers. And uh, if your uh, vehicle is found to be roadworthy and, you know, you, you cause or you, you figure in an accident, then you are more or less at the losing end of the bargain because... Well, you know, your vehicle is not towed worthy. So it is presumed that you are negligent <laughs> in one way or the other because you are using a vehicle that is not supposed to be on the road in the first place. More so if you use the, uh, what, the uh, expressway, your vehicle ought to be uh, road worthy. Because in the first place, the expressway will not let you in if your vehicle is caragarag, as, as they say. But you know, Filipinos, Filipinos are so good in you know, fixing their vehicles, working on their vehicles. They are so good in building, you know, vehicles out of different materials coming from different vehicles. Parang chap chap. But you know what? There are requirements as well under the LTO rules. If you want to use, if you want to change your engine, you have to apply for a change engine you know, permit, something like that. With the, you know, you have to get the signature of the mechanic that actually installed the new engine. Also, you have to get the signature and also the affidavit of the machine shop where you got your machine. You know, you know what we did that with our vehicle. You know, uh, we change the machine to C240 for our four-wheel drive uh, vehicle. C240, diesel, really strong, parang jeep, you know, uh, low maintenance, etc., etc. But uh, you know what? We had to uh, secure the signature of the entities that I mentioned earlier. The, the what? The mechanic and also the the shop that provided, that, that produced, or that sold you the what, the engine, the ideal engine that you, you actually wanted, that you actually 
installed in your vehicle. That way we can avoid what? We can avoid uh, instances where, or, or where in chop chop items coming from what? Coming from uh, car nap vehicles are being used in building new vehicles or other vehicles. That's why there is such a rule. Uh, it's fine actually to 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 drive if you are into prepping. It's part and parcel of prepping also bug out vehicles, right? But never to discount the what? Never to discount the importance of bicycle. You know, the bicycle and the importance of good cardio. Nothing beats good cardio because you know the the vehicle will, will conk out sooner or later. The vehicle will run out of fuel sooner or later. But you ought to be able to walk long distances or ride the bicycle for long distances. So there, uh, let me check. Actually, the uh, what I have here is my motorcycle papers. Uh, actually, the uh, official receipt is somewhat different now. It, it's just a photocopy. It looks like a photocopy already, even if you don't photocopy it. The format is somewhat uh, different from the previous one. I don't have the previous one but there. And of course, this is the ORCR. This is. I cannot flash this because privacy issues. I cannot show you my address, etc. Um, I actually keep my. This is actually for my motorcycle. I actually keep them in one place. I easily carry them. Of course, my license is also here. I don't put my license license in my wallet because I might lose it or I might use it for some other purpose. For example, baka magamit ko sa kunwari pumasok ako sa isang establishment, kailangan ng ID and my number, di ba? And then what will happen? Iwan mo yung driver's license mo. If you forget about it. Then you go your own way, and then you realize later you don't have it. You left it. That's driving without license. That's like that's like three thousand pesos as per LTO rules. If they happen to catch you doing it, uh, but uh, there's something I encountered a situation where in uh, the person actually had a license, but he simply forgot the license so so the penalty was a little bit uh, lower it's different when you drive without license when you inherently don't have a license it's also different when you drive without a license because you forgot your license it's another thing so you can actually ask for you know you, know, you can bargain with the uh, of officer that uh, sorry, I forgot my license. May 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 I go back <laughs> in my house and get it, something like that. Or may I call someone to to bring it here? We can actually try to bargain and reason out with them. You forgot, for example, you left it at the office because you used it for some other purpose. That's the reason why I don't uh, put my license in my wallet because of uh. I might use it for, for, for some other purpose. It's, and I might forget. <laughs> so it's usually with my ORCR and uh, yeah, the ORCR and other documents for the vehicle. Especially if you're riding a motorcycle. It has to be handy somewhere in your backpack. Like this. you open it so fast, so quick, and then it's there. And it's my simple bag. Okay. Makita. Show it and then one one tip that I, I can give you if you if you someday want to be a motorcycle rider is to to wear a, a helmet all the time and you uh, I mean when you're riding I mean and then to wear uh, proper footwear and you know proper attire never wear shorts uh, wear long pants better if it's uh, denim or maong and you have uh, uh, what. Uh, you're wearing shoes better if riding boots and better if you have uh, armor for your body but your body armor 
and you have uh, something for your uh, knee no uh, yeah armor for your knee as well knee pads i mean usually the body armor already includes the elbow pads you know what uh, usually if you are like that and you drive you know safely uh, in checkpoints the, the the officers will will ignore you they will just let you go or they won't even you know hail you they won't even ask you to pull those i uh, this usually happens to me when 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 i i am wearing full gear etc I, i just look at them and slow down and look at them and they say go go ahead so no problem sometimes i also stop but when i do that they still say go ahead just because i'm wearing uh you know proper gear i guess it somehow somehow exudes a message that you are driving safely and you are not a criminal and all that so okay, that's one thing that i actually, actually noticed uh incidentally uh talking of uh, driving safely uh mm, what are the you know what are the uh, rules on speed speed limits uh, you know in, when you're riding a motorcycle it's really nice really fun to to you know speed up and all that but you we have to realize that defensive driving starts with proper speed proper gear uh, you know when i say gear the the gear the engine gear first gear second third fourth fifth sixth so it starts with that proper gear and proper speed depending upon the situation depending upon the road situation the weather and the crowd or the road quality of the road when it's like a uh, barangay road or if it is uh, see um road inside subdivision so what actually what is actually the recommended or actually the legal speed what speed limit under the republic act what's the law 4136 4136 am i correct yeah, there. what is the speed limit pag nagra-ride ka sa si mga barangay road yung mga parang sa loob na ng mga subdivision ganyan speed limit is actually 20 kph only 20 kph only um there are also for b- big vehicles mga light commercial vehicles also heavy vehicles trucks also 20 kph inside the barangay roads small barangay country roads na mga maraming aso maraming bay ganun um it pays to to slow down when you are near highly habi- you know uh, populated uh, areas areas with much habitation with much with so many houses kasi nga if there is so many uh, houses expect dogs to cross parang ganun eh if you see uh, uh, what if you see you're driving speed ka tapos you're fast and then you see houses you start to see houses residences start to slow down because you know what if there are houses there are habitations there will be dogs crossing or cats <laughs> by the way uh, the other day i was driving with my wife and a cat actually crossed the street so i thought to myself wow it's not just dogs you know cats also are you know kamote killers so yeah you uh it's 20 kph actually Just another rule, yung mga, yung mga, yung populated, yung mga crowded streets, 20 kph maximum. Speaking of, uh, one reason also to, to slow down inside subdivision, uh, subdivision streets is the presence of humps, you know. Inside subdivisions, expect that there will be humps, road humps. which brings us to uh something very sad uh, uh my good friend uh, guitar player Jason Vicente uh passed away the other 
Saturday, early morning of uh, Saturday. That was yesterday morning, early morning, around 4 a.m. She came, uh, he came from a gig, a rock gig at uh, Naga City uh, at uh, Backdraft because it was the anniversary of Backdraft. Okay, he went there and his band played and uh, he went to other places. Maybe it was also a chance for him to unwind because he also got a job at the Capitol. So early in the morning, uh, he was driving inside the Naga City subdivision near Triangulo, Naga City, Barangay Triangulo, Naga City. And uh, he happened to pass by uh, Carnation Street. Okay. Apparently, I, I've never been there, but apparently Carnation Street has a really dangerous hump, a hump that is uh, almost invisible because it's not, it's not really painted. and It's higher than your usual hump, higher. And, you, you know, uh, it was early in the morning, 4 a.m. So uh, basing on the CCTV that I, I, that I actually saw, the speed of my good friend was around 40 kph. Around 40, not really 50, I'm not sure, 40 to 50, or maybe just 40. Because it was early in the morning, there was nobody there. It was riding 40, it was riding 40. But, uh, and it was unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, he ended up hitting the hump. He wasn't able, he did not see the hump. And it would have survived it, I think, uh, had there been no uh, vehicle parked therein. Because what happened was uh, he had a high side uh, crash and he flew ahead of his uh, motorcycle. And his head, even if he, he, she, he was actually wearing a helmet, his head hit the bumper of the, or apparently, or allegedly, according to the People who were there allegedly hit the bumper of the vehicle, so sad thing. And because of that, uh, maybe it led to some internal hemorrhage, and it caused him to 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 prematurely die. You know. Uh, I remember uh, when at at Wharf Gully, I I went there with a guitar a long time ago, and I. Uh, Jay actually invited me to, to jump with this band. You know. I, I happened to have a guitar at the time, and uh, his band was performing, and he invited me to actually play with the play with this uh, band. I remember it well. I was using my uh, seven string guitar, electric guitar, and I actually broke one string because I uh, I misused my whammy bar. So actually earlier I was playing. Uh, Wolfgang, or actually Manuel de Garda's uh, song, guitar song, really simple guitar song entitled uh, Blue Eleven because uh, Jay San Vicente is also a known Manuel de Garda fan, the two of us. And I remember uh, he would actually play a Wolfgang song whenever he would see me, you know, he would see me in the audience. Let's try it. Let's let's make some music for a, for a minute. This is actually Blue Eleven. Thank you. 
Mars and Beast man. Uh, that's it. That's Blue Eleven by uh, Manuel Legard. Okay, let's go to beach combing. I actually have this new interest or hobby. It's called beach combing. Have you tried it? You go to the beach and you look for interesting stuff. It could be a bottle of gin. It could be anything. It could look like garbage to other people, but you never really know what you will find. So some people actually would end up finding really important stuff. Um, let me check. I think uh, I actually tried to upload. Uh, uh, it wouldn't get uploaded. It wouldn't get uploaded. Maybe I, I'll have uh, a special video for beach combing some other time. A special video for beach combing. It's a quite a serious hobby for other people, especially abroad. May mga libro pa nga sa beach combing. Eh. So me, uh, because I'm uh, one of my farms, malapit sa beach. So there I would walk around and I happen to have interest in amulets or agimats and thing and thing and uh, talismans. So this one that I gravitate upon, it's called or gravitate on. It's called the uh, Murchanang Uli Uli. Uh, I happen to find a lot of it where where I uh, you know where I do my beach combi. You cannot really say that. Yeah, this one is the beach, the biggest mucha ng uli uli that I actually found so far. So, well, it could just be a shell or the bottomest part of the shell, but you know what? When it's already, you know, acted upon by force of nature, acted upon by the chemicals in the salt, in the water, salt water. It would actually look different. It would actually look uh, unique, like this one. This one is also big. This one looks like a rose. See? Nice. Nice. You know, it's not easy to find this stuff. Uh, you know, uh, would look and look and look, but. Don't just see these things easily. I actually found uh, this uh, shark tooth, but uh, I don't. I don't think I have. I have them here. Yeah, I don't think I have them here. Shark tooth. Beach combi. You never know what you will find. You know, earlier uh, or previously, I was into relic picking as well, you know. At Mount Isarog, I was relic picking for World War II artifacts, and you know that I've been posting uh, those uh, videos here as well. If you are, you know, also interested in those stuff, you kindly share your share the link to your channel. This will be uploaded. This even if this is a live stream, I will upload this this as a regular video. Um, there are uh, beach combing. Nice to feel the morning air at the beach. You could actually bathe after you do the deed. It's actually a nice way. It's actually a nice way also for you to, to exercise. You know, you, you hike to and fro. You know, you can you may even you may even decide to just jog or run by the beach, and later on you start your what you start your beach combi. Diba? From the term beach, yung beach, susuklayin mo siya, technically. Comb. Comb. I mean, comb. Beach. Combing. Susuklayin mo siya. Parang look for interesting stuff there. And you will find interesting stuff. In fact, isa sa mga sikat sa beach combing yung... These are actually... Uh, how to open? These are actually uh, glass. Glass. Broken glass. Sea glass. You know, uh, uh, for for you to find for you, for you to consider something a sea glass, that item must have been in the water for around twenty to thirty years. 
for it to actually turn into a sea glass. Because sea glass has some, some unique properties as well. So, parang ganyan, no? It doesn't... Parang, it's not your ordinary uh, glass. It's... There. Oh. Anyway, maybe I'll, I'll show you. I'll make a video, a better video of my sea glasses. Um, bebang kulay. And some people actually create, you know, mosaics out of it, and they would create different uh, shapes out of it. Unware, the shape of a shark or the shape of, of a whale, anything at all, out of various pieces, different pieces of sea glass. Well, it's a nice hobby. Actually, something like this also. You find, uh, for example, parts of uh, coffee cups, antique, like this one. This is Camarines or I don't know, tamarinis or wear something like kitchenware. I don't even get to hear tamarinis or kitchenware anymore. Maybe this used, this company used to exist before, but not anymore. So nice, you know. Mm, you have nothing else to do. You can actually earn money from mm, doing sea combing. You can sell the, the items as is. Driftwood is also a, a product of sea combing. You look for driftwood. Driftwood is very, very sturdy. Uh, driftwood is really nice firewood. Uh, driftwood can be a material for works of art as well. I think you have seen some uh, art installations using uh, driftwood. Oh, that's it for for beach combing. Uh, aside from, uh, you know, agimat stuff that I like to collect uh, because of my academic interest in the in the topic, uh, I finally found I finally get to have a uh, uh, buntot pagi. You know, buntot pagi. What? Wow. Oh, this is I actually just put leather on the handle so that I could make it more steady. This is not really huge. It's not the biggest Buntot Pagi ever, but this is really long and really light. So there. This hurts like hell if you get walked by this or whipped by this. This is Buntot Pagi. Buntot Pagi. I got this from, my, from a friend who is a fisherman in the area. Uh, the, 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 the ritual is when you find the, the pagi or the, or the mantare, uh, what do you do is you, uh, you cut the, this one, the, actually it's not allowed, you know, it's, it's against the law to actually kill a mantare. So what they do is they just get this, in a way it, it grows back according to them. It grows back. So what ha would happen is they would ask for permission from the mantare or something like that. May I borrow your rabies or may I borrow your power? Because this one has, I actually just kept it. This one has another, I don't know what you call that. There's a part here that actually uh, has uh, venom or something. I covered it. I did not remove it, but I covered it with, with this because it's dangerous to get pricked by it. Uh, the thing is, that's the most important part. That's the agimat part. You can actually remove it and you can actually keep it in your wallet as is. Now that I got one, I don't intend to have another. To preserve the manta race. Because uh, what if they actually get injured? You know, they actually... Not, don't survive the without their tails 
no. So according to them, they just what they cut it and they ask for permission from it, like sort of a ritual, and they set it free. They set it free. Now oral tradition has it that these words of the so-called aswang here in the Philippines. Aswang hunter, if you're an aswang hunter, you have to have this. Uh, speaking of, there's a, a Bicolano artist who's, who's been contacting me about a collab. You know, he wants us to have a collab. And he wants us to work on uh, an Aswang Hunter comics character. So that's what he wants. Maybe I will write the the the, the storyline for that. I just have to find time for it. So there. It's a belief that uh, if you have this around, if you have someone pregnant in your house, you have to have what? You have to have uh, Oh my God, it's... Yeah, there. It's a tip. The Muntotpage. Yeah. Filipino martial arts weapon also. I've seen people, I've seen practitioners using Buntot Page as FMA weapon. I'm sure there's a video here on YouTube about it. Uh, during my lecture at UP, I, I skipped the part. You know, I did not discuss the part, although there was a question from, actually from the professor herself, a professor there at UP, about the blade-related folk beliefs. Uh, she was asking about oral tradition, oral literature on blade uh, on blades, or particularly bicol blades. I did not elaborate much because it was, you know, really the not the gist of my not the focus of my topic. But yun talaga ay napakalawak na topic, ibang topic pa yun. Pero we can mention some. Yun nga kung mare buntot pagi. Oral tradition is pangdaban sa aswang, etc. But also, this is blade related because it's also part of Filipino martial arts. Pinagamit din, Filipino martial arts. Uh, speaking of Bicol blades, uh, in Bucabulara de la Lengua Bicol, there's a mention of the word barat. You know, the barat being, the, uh, being a kind of a talisman for, for the early Bicolanos. You know, the barat, where's that blade? There's a blade here, wait. Okay, excuse me. I used to just keep my blade here, one of my blades here. This a small, you know, thing, mini, you know, thing. You know, the barat is this one. Sometimes it's made of bronze, but this one is not made of bronze. Aluminum lang ito. So, this one is the crown of the hilt of the bicol blade, which is usually, when you talk of bicol blade, we usually refer to hilt made of carbow horn, usually black carbow horn, but if you get the albino carbow horn in the better, so much the better. Um, there, the barat, according to vocabulary de la Longuicol, according to early Spanish accounts, was regarded by early Bicolanos as a talisman, kind of a talisman or a, a gimat. I think because part nga yan ng, ano eh, ng hill. Kasi nga, pati to. For example, oral tradition, oral narratives, oral literature pertaining to the hills of the Bicol Minas Bad or the Bicol Blades. Um, the Tagungirit entity. The Tagungirit entity, in my view, could be, could very well be the Bicol Tenegre. Could very well be the Bicol Tenegre. I mean to say, when, when we talk of Tenegre in Bicol, we're talking of the hilt. The Tenegre hilt. However, in, in the Visayas area, when you talk of Tenegre, it's actually a blade, the Tenegre blade. But here in Bicol, there's also Tenegre, but Tenegre as hilt. And actually, as I, as I wrote in one essay that I published at the Minas Bad Shop, I think two years ago or three years ago, yeah. uh, the... Uh, ito, itong, uh, tenegre na to siya talaga tasip tagong irit eh. it's an entity 
uh, in the forest kind of weird because would show your it show would show its face only halfway pa ganyan nakatago sa puno ay ito yung puno pa ganyan ganyan siya and nakainis nakatakot and that entity would disappear and would, would you know would be a little bit menacing and would cause you alarm etc <laughs> would alarm you would you know pester you could very will be the could very will be the tagongirit because of that kind of behavior mischievous face mischievous green by the bicol tenegre uh, however there's also a belief that the bicol pinaniki the pinaniki i don't have my pinaniki handle it's inside uh, one of the boxes there. Uh, actually, could very well be the Hinilawod epic bat. There's a there's a Hinilawod epic in the Visayas. Eh? So it has uh, uh, a character or, or an entity there that is actually a bat. The name of the entity is Uyutang. Uyutang. Uyutang could very well be the allusion to the Bicol Pinaniki. More so that Bicolanos, okay, are believed to be from the Visayas region. I mean, the peopling of Bicol came from the south, or the population of Bicol came from the south during the early days, according to historians and archaeologists. There's even a theory that Bicol used to be what? Used to be part of what? Part of the Visayan region. Let me check. Uh, I don't have my notes here, but yeah. Another thing, oral tradition, folk beliefs, the Onglo, the Inonglo, or the Bicol uh, Minas Bad Hill, Bicol as Kinabayo, is also called as Inonglo here in Bicol because the Onglo or the Tikbalang has the body of a man with the head of a horse. That's why. And there's also, also a belief here that if you get or to get if you get to acquire the, the spine of the tikbalang, then that's power. That's power. But if you have a minus bad, look at it. It would look it actually looks like where's my minus bad? I don't have it here. Okay. It actually looks like a what? It actually looks like uh, an unglo. Okay. And the blade actually looks like the what? Actually looks like the spine of the what? Of the unglo or of the what? Sino nga to? Sorry. Tikbalang. Excuse me. Let me get my blade. I'm sorry about that. So I got my blade now. As we were saying, something I didn't discuss at UP because of time time constraints, and I didn't know that there was to discuss this particular aspect of people blade culture. So we're talking about the Inong Law, and we are saying we were saying that Inong Law actually pertains to Tikbalang because Ong Law is actually Tikbalang. And there's another Iqbalang here in Bicol. We call it Kapingis. Kapingis is an entity which has the body, may katawan ng elemental, na mahaba ang extremities niya, ang kamay, ang haba, parang kawayan. Ang haba. But the head of a horse. Pero iba yun, iba yun. We're talking about the Iqbalang or the Ulo. So here's the Iqbalang, here's the Ulo. And the blade now becomes the spine of the Iqbalang. Spinal cord. Parang ganun yun. Pag nakuha mo yan, that's power. So, ito na. It's like the minus bad. So, ito yung thoracic part ng spine. 
sacral, I mean, lumbar, cervical, thoracic, sacral, lumbar, lumbar area. Ito. Yung nasa puwitan. Yung coccyx. Apparently, parang, ano, ay, hindi coccyx, ito nga pala yun. At sa lumbar, parang yung, nandun yung, ano, ito yung meditation, yung parang kundalini. Kundalini pa. Ayan. Tama ba? Kundalini. That's it. Tikba lang. Tik parang paniniwala na tikba lang ko. Tikba lang. Oh, by the way, andito si Will dyan, pare. Uh, trash, transform to gems by nature. Wow. O, yun nga eh. Yung, ano eh, yung, ang tawag nun, uh, yung sea glass. Ito naman, uh, sabi pa niya, typical or common po ba niya, sir, na hero sa minus bat ay kabayo o kinabayo. Actually, uh, yeah, yun talaga eh. Kasi, yun nga, mga, mga makers, pag minasbad, ang bagay naman talaga, or kahit na, ano, kahit na gusto mo, kung nari, pinaniki, etc. Hindi bagay naman talaga, hindi bagay. Talagang kabayo ang bagay sa minasbad, pinabayo. Na typical talaga na, or common, na ginagamit na hilt sa minasbad, pinabayo. Kasi para bang, yun daw kasi yung bagay. O, oh, as per, the message. As per, uh, what? As per, ano din, belief na rin ng mga tao. Yeah, uh, there. So, oral tradition, tikba lang, di ba? The hill, kabayo, parang gano'n. That's one degree. There are so many other hills kasi. I uh, actually had a video of that already. Ang dami pa niyan eh. You know, really run out. Pero nakita pa nga ako na shark eh. Shark. Pinabayo, tenegre, inaya, moda dog, pinabalang, pinaniki. And I am I'm, I am of the theory that uh, this hills actually are representative of the Sarimau, the Sarimau monsters. Yung Sarimau monsters kasama sila sa ili sa ibalong, ibalong epic. Sila ay uh, mga monster na mapagiganti na in exile ipinatapon ni Hanjong sa Mount Pulasik. So yung mga uh, Sarimau. So, parang magandang angulong tingnan. Yung mga hilt na yan, sa Bicol Blades, ay sila yung mga Sarimau. Kasi iba-iba yung mga kwent. Tsura. Sarimau monsters. Yun nga, nagalit nga sa kanila si Hanjong at sila ay ipinatapon sa Mount Colasi. Sarimau. Ano ba kasi ang Sarimau? Sila ay parang mga vengeful na monsters could be compared to para bang yung mga tao na nag-extrajudicial killing vengeful sila they don't follow uh, legal you know procedures etc parang sila mga hitman no? riding in tandem or something so punisher o oh, diba yung ganda ng aspect na yun paniniwalaan natin paniniwalaan natin it's better Uh, imagine coming from Balong. Although some people are saying that Ibalong is not a real epic, although it's the very first epic discovered in the Philippines. The epic of Ibalong. Sabi daw, ang sumulat na lang naman, lang naman daw niyan is si Melendreras. Trey Melendreras. Uh, beach combing. Ano yung sila mo natin from beach combing? Uh, at UPD Liman, I actually talked about uh, uh, what? Um, why I'm interested in Bicol Blades. I talked about it. And what is so special about uh, Bicol Blades? I also talked about it. Where is Bicol? Uh, what are the three main Bicol Blade profiles? And what is the native Venus pad with round pitch? Oh, why is the native Venus pad with round pitch? Uh, how did history shape Bicol blade culture? How about the Iron Age? Was there Iron Age in Bicol? So was iron abundant in Bicol? Okay. 
how were the vehicles able to develop skills in metal craft? Um, what led to the development of the Sinagangan? Um, how did the Cimarrones participate during World Ah, did the Cimarrones participate during the World War II? I actually uh, showed them or gave them a link to my uh, video on the Cimarron armies. I actually already uh, have an episode on uh, Cimarron armies already. But it's not public yet. But for uh, educational purposes, I, I gave the link uh, to the professor at UT. So he could show it to the students. Uh, cultural research. I know, I know that so many people, marami interesado sa Cimarron fighting art or Cimarron armies. Um, I uh, found a Cimarron armies. Practitioner. Actually, I found at least three practitioners. Uh, uh, and they happen to be friends, all of them. In fact, no, they, 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 are, they live in separate areas, Mount Isarog, but they are friends. And sometimes I, I would meet them in one place lang. At the time, they didn't, I didn't know they were actually practitioners of Cimarron armies. Later, uh, ko na lang nalaman. And I was only able to get a footage of, of one of them doing some drills, just one. I still have to visit them again so that I can get their styles, all of them. Um, I know so many uh, uh, Marsh, uh, FMA practitioners would want to perhaps go there and learn from them, but I don't think it would be that easy to, you know, Kasi nga, ako, it took me three years. No? Uh, they never told me about there being a, a Cimarron fighter. Uh, there being Cimarron fighters. They never mentioned it. Um, it was only later na na-realize ko, nang kausap ko pala mga Cimarron pa rin. Uh, but uh, they never mentioned it. More so, their fighting art. They never mentioned their fighting art. So, it's like a secret to them. Sinda-sinda lang. Sila-sila lang. Uh, but uh, somehow they, they also share it if they know you. For example, they've been seeing me for three years already. They know me. I actually, I actually have a, a place at, we actually have a place at Montesaro or uh, at Lampili. I mean, already part of Montesaro. And I would actually frequent to visit the Montesaro area, uh, Cimarron, what? Cimarron tribe spot over there. Actually, came up with an episode on that some other earlier. I hope you, you were able to hear what I was saying. Kasi I removed my mic. Parang connected nga pala sir yung tikba lang at pinasbad. May bago na naman ako nalaman. Parang ganun na eh. Lagi namang may connection yan because uh, you know, uh, uh, before uh, Ganun naman eh, humans followed indigenous knowledge. Indigenous knowledge came from science. And their science were also their mythology. And were, their mythology was also, was also their religion. Science was also their mythology. Mythology was also their religion. So it all came from that particular culture. Yeah, yeah. It's all about culture. Diba? So there. Uh, um, I said that uh, during the lecture that Bicol is at Southern Luzon. There's uh, Bicol Peninsula, Bicol Main Islands, a main peninsula, yung Camarines, uh, Camarines Norte, Camarines Sur, Albayas or Sogon. Main Islands would be Masbate and Katanduan. I said also that uh, what's so different about Bicol Blades? I said Bicol Blades are the meeting point or the melting point of Bico Philippine blade culture. Kasi nasa kanya na yung ano, eh, elements ng, ng blade. I'm not saying na superior yung Bicol Blade or what. Parang nasa kanya yung elements na complete. Kasi nasa gitna siya eh. Ng island, nasa southern Luzon. Pag pumunta ka sa north, 
puro naman full tang doon eh. Full tang, wala naman talagang ukit talaga sa hill. Although magaling umukit yung mga kay, kapatid nating taga-cordillera. Pero sa mga hill nila, hindi sila umukit, naka-full tang, walang rat tail. Tapos ganun yung shape ng uh, hinalong at saka pinahig. Tapos sabi ko pa, pag pumunta ka down south, nag-start na magkaroon ng rock, rat tail tang. Halimbawa, uh, punta kang Pangasinan, rat tail tang na eh. Rat tail tang na may rivet sa, natuhog sa hill. Or may rivet sa pamel or sa punyo. Kaya alam, wala pa rin talaga silang culture ng pag pag uukit doon. Hindi talaga prevalent. Hindi talaga yun ang main motif. Even if you go sa Katag- Tagalog region, itak Antipolo, halimbawa, parang Bicol Blade na rin yan kasi malapit na eh. Malapit sa Southern Luzon. May Ratil Tang din, tapos may ano din, may, may Hilt din na through and through ang Tang, tapos may maganda ring what may maganda ring barat or rivet ang ganda nga ng rivet ng ano eh ng uh, mga itak ng tagalog eh uh, at itak antipolo i mean antipolo visa punta ka sa visayas mm, gaganda ng mga ukit san sibar ukit ng uh, bakunawa Di naman talaga tumatagos yung rattail tang nila eh. Wala naman talagang rivet. Although, minsan may mga uh, Visayan blades na yung rivet nila nasa side, nasa side ng hill nandito. Nandiyan. Parang yung mga bushcraft knives. So, that's how it would look like. It would look like. Lalo na pag pumunta ka sa Mindanao, wala naman talaga silang focus sa pagka-carve ng mga hill. Tapos, ang ganda ng shape, lalo yung kalis. May rivet din naman. I don't know how they call the rivet sa, sa Chris yung parang nakagano'n na dalawang parang rivet. Pero, hindi sila through and through ang blade nila. Nakatusok lang ngayon na ganyan sa hill. Hindi yan tagos doon. So yun nga, compare mo sa Bicol, may element tayo ng mga Moro Blades kasi yung mga burda, yung mga tawag nun, serration. Diba yung serration, meron yan ng Moro Blades eh. Meron din tayo niyan. May element tayo ng Visayan Blades kasi may hilt carving. May, hilt carving. may element tayo ng... Uh, Tagalog, South, Northern Luzon Blades, uh, particularly, you know, mga Tagalog Blades na naka-Pangasinan Blades na naka-ribet sa dulot, through and through. May element tayo ng ganyan. Pero yung sila, wala silang carving. Naiiba din talaga yung mga hinalong sa ka, ano tawag nun, uh, pinahig. Pero may element din tayo ng hinalong at pinahig in the sense na our blades are also tough. I'm not saying that the others are not tough. Pero para may pagka hindi masyadong makinis unlike say Visayan blades. Ang galing-galing nila maghasa. Oh, Visayan, Visayan blades. Mag mga Visaya. Ang linis nga yung pinote. Ang linis. Ang linis. So that, that's it. Kaya that's why Nakapagsabi ko na parang kakaiba ang Bicol Blades. Kasi nasa kanila yung... Parang, parang complete ang Bicol Blade. Complete. Form and function. So parang ganun. Tapos, three main Bicol Blade profiles. Minas Bad ginunting sa kase ng palo. I also talked about the Minas Bad... The, the various Minas Bad profiles. The various ginunting profiles. In the, the sundang... Bakit nga ba round tip ang Minas Bad? I discussed the regulation theory... Spanish regulation pero hindi naman masyadong tenable because uh, Bicolanos then were also using what? Were also using Ginunting at the time. I mentioned also Miner's Blade Theory because there's a belief that uh, the Minas Bad actually came from what? From where? Uh, Mas Bad? Minas? Mas Bate. And if you look at history, you'll know that Mas Bate was um, you know, a gold mine. Eh. 
actually the first contact sa Bicol ng uh, mga Espanyol. Espany- Mas bati, ang una nilang nakita. And nakita nila yung mga mina doon eh. So miners blade, para pang panghukay din eh. Kaya around the tip. I also discussed tactical, I also talk about tactical theory kasi si Maron Fighting Arts, itutusok mo sa lupa to blind or obscure the, the vision of your opponent. Kasi round tip. Yun. Why is the minus bad with round tip? Three theories. Regulation theory, Spanish regulation, miners blade theory, and tactical theory. Now, how did the history shape Bicol blade culture? Well, was there a stone age in Bicol? Parang meron. Kasi dahil sa nahanap na mga burial jars with human bones intact 3,000 years ago ang date. Stone implements. So, may, may meron tayong uh, rock. Ano to? Stone age. Meron bang iron age sa Bicol? Iguamanda? Because of the Kalanay people, Kalanay connection. Kasi yung Kalanay people, uh, they made the uh, pottery. And yung mga pottery nila, yung cover nun, may ukit. Tapos yung conclusion ng mga archaeologists, napaka-fine ng ukit. Na gumamit dapat, sigurado gumamit sila ng bakal para ma- magawa, magawa nila yung ukit. So yung conclusion nila, gumamit sila ng bakal. So the Kalanay people introduced the use of iron sa Bicol. And the Kalani people came from Annam and Tonkin, or Vietnam. They spread after 1000 BC up to Visayas, Palawan, then Malate. Mas bati, I mean. Yun nga, Kalani pottery found at uh, Mas bati, Kalani cave. These were burial jars with finely chiseled grooves or canals found in the jar cover. So was iron abundant in Bicol? Was, was iron abundant in Bicol? Apparently, abundant siya. Kasi nga, noong 1668, after skirmishes with the Dutch, nung wala nang away with the Dutch yung mga Espanyol, isipan nilang magproduce ng iron locally sa Pilipinas, and they find much iron sa Camarines. Meaning, Camarines or Camarines Norte. It was only recently that uh, Camarines was actually... Uh, subdivided into, into two uh, provinces. Dati isa lang yan. So there, there was much much iron. Abund- there was abundance of iron in Bicol. And the Bicolanos were able to develop their skills in metal craft because of uh, the gold mines. Bicolanos were into you know, making jewelries, etc. Sabi pa nga, we were the best Met, you know, jewelry makers at the time, Bicolanos. Uh, Conquistador Martin de Goiti, guided by a lady chief of Visayan, sailed for Masbad in February 1567. So the very first contact ng mga Bicolano sa mga Espanyol ay nangyari sa Masbad. Sa pangkatangian ng Bicol Blade, sir, ay makapal ang spine. Oo nga, oo nga. Kapalang spine. Kapalang spine. Heavy, heavy duty. It's actually tricky din. It's tricky. Kasi makapalang spine, baka maging mabigat, mahirap pasain, so kailangan mag, mag numipis siya sa edge. So, minsan yung mga panday, di, di na nila alam yung Tamang weight, tamang balance, so it's tricky. Minsan, tsambahan, nakukuha nila yung tamang weight, tamang balance. But I, I guess the, the older blacksmiths, nung uh, unang panahon, alam na alam nila. Tapos yun, when the Spaniards came sa mas bata, they found mines of gold as deep as 2 to 4 estados up to 10, uh, up to 100 estados. Estados being uh, measurement, unit of measurement of distance, vertical distance, I mean. Vertical distance. One estado is 1.7 meter. Kaya nga daw, lumipat ang, ang kumbaga, ang, ang mga Espanyol from Cebu to Panay. Kasi 
yung panay, malapit-lapit sa Bicol. Kasi gusto nilang makuha yung ginto sa Bicol. Yun. Pero may, mali, may ibang reason naman, baka dahil sa pre- pressure ng Portuguese. Pressure ng Portuguese sa mga Espanyol, kaya lumipat sila sa... Pero ba, hindi yun nga, to prove na talaga maraming gold talaga sa Bicol early on. Ibalong, the land of Bulawan. Bulawan being gold. And because the Bicolanos were so much abundant in gold, Bicolanos were also into uh, jewelry making and therefore it enhanced their ability in metallurgy and in metal craft. Which also led them to become experts in blade production, in armor production, and in shield production, arrowhead production, cannons. In fact, there's there are accounts that that point to the fact that Bicolanos actually what that the Bicolanos had a vocabulary replete with words pertaining to military science. Words pertaining to weaponry. What happened? Why we no longer have those words? I don't know. Maybe the Spaniards wiped it out of our memory. The Bicols were the most skilled artificers in jewels and gold that we have seen on this island, according to one report. Galing to kay Dr. Dani Arona. Siya nag And the Beagles had good armor, helmets, arms, and a vocabulary replete with terms pertaining to warfare. As noted by the first Spaniards and reported by William Henry Scott and Bicolano scholar, blade scholar, Polix Robosa, the late Polix Robosa. Now, what led to the development of the Sinagangan? Bakit nagkasinagangan? Sinagangan, come here. Sinagangan. You may have to... No, my second. Ping, ping, ping. My second. This one is bronze sagang. Probably because of the Spanish influence, because the the the, the wielders of the 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 sinagangan were the Cimarrones, and the Cimarrones were actually a uh, hybrid of the Alta and the Spanish. And uh, the Cimarrones were also experts in bow and arrow, or the Marra, arrow Marra. The use of the penaldus, oh, there's a penaldus, I, I don't have my penaldus, it's down, it's sa baba eh. And wala yung penaldus. Let me, let me check, baka pwede, you get it. Oh, it's here. The penaldus is here. So experts in the use of penaldus, minas bad, yung mga cimarrones, penaldus. Tres Cantos. Tres Cantos, Tres Cantos. Pangpaldos. Pangpaldos. Parang stick lang siya. Parang kalap. Parang bala. So there. Uh, mm, there. Um, experts in the use of the uh, penaldos. And the lumay. Lumay or some kind of a... Like a potion. Potion, not poison, potion, so that the enemy would, 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 the enemy would not be able to fight. Matatagal po or something. Uh, during practice, you would use the uncal or the coconut uh, or coconut flower or the spathe of the coconut flower or the spathe without the inflorescence. Yung uncal. In the kalap, the stick, you would use it. Bamboo sticks with charcoal. Para pag tumama, eh, meron kang tama na charcoal. So alam na tumama. Um, they became outlaws from Spanish rule, yung mga simarones. And, but they would also raid lowlands, especially ranches. Uh, and this is according to Captain Henry, Captain Henry Phelan, American reporter, soldier. Uh, nasaan ba yung mga simarones? They were found at the slopes of Mount Isarog, forested hills of Siruma, and Karamoan. Dahat palang pinupuntahan ko, may Simarron. Eh. We have a place at uh, Mount Isarog. We also have a place at Siruma. We also have a place at 
karamuan to. <laughs> Puro pa si Maron, baka si Maron ako eh. I don't know, I'm not. Si Maron Arnis. Secret art. Oh, called Secret Art. Even now, people are still looking for it. Also, uh, the Cimarrones became devotees of uh, Peña Francia. Moro raids could have, uh, the, you know, the more could have contributed to the development of the Sinagangan Minas Bad. Paano ba kasi nag-start yun? The, the Moros, according to history, were into, not not really because of religion, but they were into slave trade, especially the Sama people. According to some friends, sabi nila, friend of mine, mga practitioner. Uh, the Sama people were also slaves, and they were being asked to capture other slaves. And because of that, the Spaniards had to, the Spaniards wanted to, you know, subjugate the Moros. But to no avail, they sent uh, Esteban Rodriguez de Figueroa According to them, they actually won. After the karoon ng uh, truce, the karoon ng deal, ng treaty or something, pero hindi naman yun in honor ng mga Spanyol. So, Figueroa came back and Figueroa was, Figueroa was killed by the, by, the, by the Moros. And the Moros counter-attacked. Kaya natalo yung mga <laughs> Spanyol na hirapan sila. Moro raids! Kakarating daw yan hanggang sa saan ba yun? Hanggang sa as far as Ilocos. Siyempre, Sorsogon, Albay, Camarines, Ilocos. Nakarating ba yan sa Baaw? According to Polix Robosa, the people of Baaw prepared for uh, a raid and uh, at one point, the Bicolanos won against the Moros at the Battle of Tabgon Bay. I still don't know where Tabgon Bay is. Maybe, anapin nga natin yan. Tabgon Bay, asan, asan ba yan? So, there's a belief that the Sinagangan was actually developed to counter the Scalis. Did the Cimarron participate during the Moro Wars? We're not sure. Cimarrones, uphill sila eh. Plan. Yung mga readers, nasa shoreline yan. So, we're really not sure. We're not sure. But maybe. maybe. How about World War II? Parang oo, sumali ang si Maroni. So, World War II kasi nga naman, yung Mount Isarog ay naging World War II site at nandun nga sila. At may study si Dr. Cyril Conde, PhD, ng Ateneo de Naga University, kung kung sa fighting art ng mga si Maroni. Naginamit laban sa mga hapon. Okay. At maraming bring home items sa mga American soldiers na mga blades na gamit ng mga simaron. Nandun sila. Ang gaganda ng mga minasbad sa Amerika eh. Nandun sa kanila eh. Inuwi dun eh. Uh-huh. And there's actually an exist- existing copy of a sinagangan sa Mount Isarog owned by a nanding. Uh, a certain nanding. Actually, he's my friend. <laughs> Nandun. Uh, yan. Nandun eh. So, siya, may simaron blood. So, yun. Meron talagang simaron doon. So, how's Bicol Blade culture now? Well, sabi ko nga doon, ginagamit ang minas bad ng mga sundalo, AFP. Bicolano soldiers use the minas bad. At probably, pati yung ating mga kaibigan ng mga pogi dyan sa tas tas the insurgents, they are also using the Minaspad, even now. Uh, it also still cosmopolitan in the countryside, carried by farm owners and what? Uh, farm owners and workers. Uh-huh. There was even a uh, uh, our present- representation of the Minas Bad in poetry, in literature, na may mention sa mga short stories ng mga writer na Bicolano. Poetry nila. Uh, pati nga sa art. There's actually uh, marami ng painting eh, depicting the Minas Bad eh. Painting depicting the Minas Bad, painting depicting the, the what? The Cimarrones, gawa ng mga Bicolano na painting. There's actually an art installation produced in 2018 by Paolo Guerrero. Yung art ay yung El Cimarron. 
Kelsey Maroon. So, yan. And after, up to now, people are still very curious about what? About si Maroon Arnis. Okay. That's it. Tagal-tagal na ng online anong ito. Tinatawag natin uh, uh, live stream. Tadadan, tadadan, tadadan. Teka nga, teka nga. Live stream, live stream. Patunogin nga natin ito. Yan. Gamitin ang minas bag. Mag-hiking, hiking sa gubat. Mag-camping, camping at summer. Summer na naman. Mag-cycling, cycling tayo. Mag-ride, ride. Ritual. Ritual ng mga simaron. Pag ginamitan ka daw ng lumay, matatagal po. Matatagal po! Mike. Tulagin natin ang ating ritual. Ang ritual. Tagal po. Mag-ingat. Aba, sumabit. At baka kayo ay matagal po. Alright. Wow, what a music. Alright. Jason here for the Hagbayon channel. And TMS Talks. It's time for bed. Remember, the pen is mightier with the sword. Thanks for joining me, Parang Biljan. Si Biljan nga pala, magaling itong gumawa ng mga knife at magaling itong maghasa. At uh, nanalo sa first Philippine cutting competition. Thank you, pare. And also, uh, shout out to Lady Simaron. Shout out to Flor DC. Shout out to um, Jose Rizal Adventures. Sario Solis. Sino pa? Shout out to Giovanni Buen, Yatoy Caretas, Ong De La Torre, The Shaman. There. But of course, Santiago Villafania. The, the gang will join us again next time for a live stream on the Agi Map Culture. Right? Remember the pen is mightier with the sword. Thanks for watching. Happy, happy Sunday. Good night. Yeah.